All right, we're recording. Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, TSO committee tonight. This is the uh, November 10th, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022. This meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to assess the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the meeting, the proceedings in real time via technological means. Okay, so a call to order, and I'm just going to go ahead and do roll call, make sure everyone can, I can hear everyone and they can be heard. And Shalini, we just heard you, but Shalini? I'm present. Okay. Anna? Hello, everyone. Dorothy? Hello, right here. Andy? Present. And welcome, Paul? Hi. And thank you, Mandy, for joining. Can you hear us, Mandy? You there? Yeah. Okay. All right. So with that, I'm going to thank you, Mandy and Anna, and I'm going to hand the floor over to the two of you for a proposed street lighting policy. Awesome. I'm just trying to find my computer charger, but I am still here. I'm um, sorry, I realized like, uh-oh, 10%. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody. I, uh, Mandy and I had worked on a proposal around street lights for a while, and I'm sure that she will describe it much more eloquently than I will, but the idea here is sort of twofold, right? We or we really wanted to not only think about where streetlights go, but also think about the type of streetlights that we are utilizing and how we can best protect our community um, and the natural resources that we have as well. So Mandy, if you wanna jump in here and talk a little bit maybe about the process plus any other overview you feel like sharing, that would be. Pardon me, I'm just noticing um, Shalini's hand up. Oh, sorry. Just a quick question for the public that's watching, like just mm -hmm. they don't know when will the public comment be? <clears throat> I believe it's later on on the agenda, but I can double check that. I don't know, Anika, if you've got it up. You're muted, Anika. Public comment is scheduled to be after um, the uh, the discussion, the continued discussion on um, universal refuse. So later on in the meeting. Thank you. Uh, Mandy, do you wanna, do you wanna give a, an overview? Sure, I'll, I'll try. Um, so yeah, we worked on this and, and as Anna said, it's twofold. One is to think about where we put streetlights in town. And that's sort of the, what I would call part two of this particular policy, proposed policy. And part one was to think about what the lights do and how they operate basically. And so that, that specification section is the section that really deals with trying to make our lights um, more what people like to refer to as dark sky compliant. They might be now, um, some of them might be, some of them might not be, um, but also look at the, the spectrum um, okay. that they are. Um, so, you know, we've got parts of the proposal that talk about how they must be, there must be no uplighting you know, so that we're not lighting the sky, we're lighting the parts that need lit. Um, parts of the proposal that talk about what the um, color temperature should be, more on the yellow side than on the very white blue side, because the yellow side um, doesn't affect the, the night um, awakeness of not just uh, humans, but others as much um, as the blue light type does. Um, specifications related to, um, glare um and and you know where lights shine so they can be downlit but if they're not shielded properly they can really light spots downlit that we don't really want lit if we're looking at a street light we really want that street light to light the street and maybe the sidewalk we don't really want it to light someone's yard um you know that's not what a street light is intended to do um, and so putting the proper shielding on, putting the proper um, 
covers on to make sure it's not causing glare in places and, and things like that are um, part of what that, that specification section of this proposed policy does. The second part of the policy is to look at and propose um, what Anna and I tried to propose is where we put street lights. Um, and, and that seemed to be at the council before this got referred, the more concerning part of our proposal. But, but that was really a, an attempt to say, where in town do we need street lights? Um, do we want street lights? Need or want? They could be different things. Um, and where don't we want them? And so that's what sort of the second part does. And if we want to, you know, we can get into more about our thinking on that one if we get to that versus the specifications. But that's really the two parts of it and, and what we're doing. The goal is to not light areas we aren't supposed to be lighting with street lights, to keep them as healthy for um, humans and animals as possible, um, and then to make sure we're only putting them in the spots we want them. And uh, thank you so much, Mandy. Athena, if it's possible, James Lowenthal is one of our community um, supporters on this, and he is much more knowledgeable in many ways about some of the science. Um, Mandy and I have done a lot of research and know a lot more than, like you thought I knew a lot about sewers. Wait till you see what I know about lights, y'all. Uh, but if we could bring James in, that would be, that'd be great, if it's okay with the chair. And uh, Athena, if you're able to do that. Anika? Absolutely, yes, please. Yeah. And I'm just noticing while he comes in, I'm noticing Dorothy's hand is up. Yeah, I wanted to make sure he was here before we started getting into questions, that's all. Thank you. Hi, James. Um, so can we, before we go to questions, uh, again, Athena, if this is okay, can we uh, just ask James to introduce himself briefly and say hello to folks? Is that okay? Is that okay, Anika? Okay. Anika. All right, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is James Lowenthal. I'm professor of astronomy at Smith College, uh, and I'm a member of the five colleges astronomy department. So I'm in Amherst all the time. Uh, I was in Amherst just a few minutes ago. I just rode back on my bike. Uh, and uh, I uh, have a, uh, a long standing um, uh, interest and passion and experience on this issue. Uh, I lead a local organization called Northampton City Lights. I lead a, a statewide organization that is the uh, Massachusetts chapter of the International Dark Sky Association. Um, I'm the chair of the American Astronomical Society uh, Committee on Light Pollution, and I'm the vice president of the International Astronomical Union Commission on Site Protection, which is basically a light pollution um, thing. So this is part of a worldwide uh, movement to protect the natural darkness of the night sky by not just astronomers, but uh, ecologists and human health professionals. There is a, a, a mountain of evidence supporting the need to protect the night sky for all the reasons that Mandy Jo just said, uh, not just the visibility of the night sky, but human health and wildlife. Um, there, there's a whole field of uh, chronobiology, time, um, the, uh, the uh, circadian rhythms, the day-night cycles and the 24-hour clocks of animals, uh, almost all of which it's set by the natural darkness, the dark light cycle. And it turns out that every species that is studied, including humans, depends on natural darkness at night to thrive. Uh, the ecosystems that surround us, we, we hear a lot about habitat destruction uh, being a major threat to many species. The naturally dark night is the habitat for most species, and they need that darkness to thrive. And uh, when we when we ruin it with light pollution, we're doing the same thing as when we take the water out of a, a wetland. I mean, we all know that the frogs will die if we do that. And likewise, most species suffer when we flood the nighttime with light. So it's entirely possible to have light where we want it, where we need it, uh, at the level that we need it without overdoing it. But if we don't think about it, the tendency is to overdo it. There's a very strong uh, a tendency to uh, to just throw light at problems. Everybody knows that fear of the dark is a thing, and most of us have it, and it's probably in our DNA, and it's not going to go away. The question is, what do we do about it? And throwing light at it indiscriminately is uh, a, a bad habit that we've developed, and uh, it doesn't actually make anything anybody safer. Um, and in fact, overlighting is is uh, counterproductive. Uh, for the same reason that shining a flashlight in your own eyes is counterproductive. If you want to see something, you shine the flashlight away from your eyes, not in your eyes. But um, we tend to forget that when we 
um, when we turn streetlights on that spread glare in every direction. And that's actually not even good for safety. The whole point of streetlights or any lights outdoors is almost always for safety. But if the light's poking you in your eye, in the eyes, like a flashlight in your eyes, then it's not helping anybody. So it is possible to have good light outside. Uh, there are other communities that do it. Amherst's uh, bylaw is extremely well thought out. Uh, I'm very impressed with the work that uh, that uh, councilors uh, Devlin Gautier and Haneke have done, and um, it's it, I think it's a good model of uh, of how a city and town can uh, can set a, a good proactive policy going forward uh, and bit by bit uh, fix the the mistakes of the past and uh, and have safety and beauty and human health and uh, uh, protection of wildlife and bring back the night sky all at the same time. It's a total win-win. Thanks, James. So uh, I'll be collecting, and I'm sure Mandy will too, because she is uh, always as good, better at this than I am, uh, questions today. We may not have all the answers today, but those that we do not have answers to, we will um, get back to. And I wanted to, someone asked me today, uh, what, what was going to happen with this? You know, I think that there's, there's folks who uh, as James said, fear of the dark is a very real thing. And so there are folks who are, her, who are um, understandably apprehensive. And so we wanna make sure that we're giving time to that, to those concerns. And so we may not have answers for you right now, but uh, we will make sure to, to get them and get back to you and that this is a process and we're gonna, we're gonna move through it. So um, with that, Anika, I'm gonna turn it back over to you to do whatever you wanna do here. Unless you want me to call on people, I'm happy to yeah, do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that this is uh, your baby and you should continue with the questions. Um, awesome. Mandy and I are, are going to be quite the co-parenting team here. All right, so uh, Dorothy, what you got for us? Well, I have a question, but I'll preface it that um, I agree we don't want overlighting, but I don't also want underlighting. And yes, we have fear of the dark, but I agree with you. I have fear of glare. Um, as I've gotten older, the glare of, of certain lights at night makes it so I can't see that it blinds me. So I, I think that we can reach an accommodation. Um, I just don't, I'm afraid of underlighting on some residential streets. But I have a question which Mr. Bockham can answer. Um, we've noticed that some street lights that are being replaced are being replaced with really tall street lights. And um, I, you know, I've talked several people have talked about this with me. We wonder why are they so tall? Isn't that spreading light beyond where we need it? I mean, the point is we're not an airstrip. We don't have anything that's got to come and land. Um, we want street lights, the people that I know, the residential on the residential streets, so you can walk on the street and not fall in a hole um, and not be be hit by a car. So we we basically want enough light to do that. And but I I there seems to be these new tall, tall ones. And I, I just want to know what is why is that happening and what does it mean? So this is to Mr. Bachelman. Uh, so you'd have to give me some reference points with streets. I don't know the answer to that question without knowing. Well, Mc McClellan is one, and uh, there's I, I can get you that list of streets. Yeah. So I don't know the answer off the top of my head. But... Okay, so you're, you're not aware of the fact that they're putting in much taller lights? No. No, okay. All right, because, I mean, I'm totally in support of the part <laughs> of the bylaw that talk about shielding the light, changing the light bulb to, I guess it's a blue light, which is more tolerated by the natural world. So Horrible. those parts, you've got me. Blue. It's just this part two. Um, you know, I, I want to have quiet, respectful, um, necessary lights for safety on residential streets. But I do, I agree. I do not want overlighting either. So thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. And this was also referenced um, in a in the note from Tracy that um, Paul. I'm not sure if that was sent to you, but I'll send it to you as well, so you can see what she's talking about with the taller placement of the lights uh, as well. I'll make sure that gets to you, uh, Anika. Yeah, so I have a question about um, sidewalk lighting. Um, and I also just wanted to say that, um, you know, we, it is amazing how we can adjust. I, I did grow up here the, with the dark streets, but lived uh, the majority of my life on very bright streets. Um, 
in in New York City. So it's very, it's uh, you know, everything is lit up. And when I first returned back here, I actually had to walk around and I'm sure all of my neighbors were like, here she comes. And I had one of these army flashlights <laughs> would like would light the, the streets in front of me until my eyes adjusted. And, you know, now I, I see just fine down uh, the streets. But um, so I, I'm right downtown. So my question is really about like, which what is um, what are the best ways or practices to light some of the heavy, like the heavy foot traffic downtown sidewalks that are, you know, arteries into going downtown that can be blackout patches in a way where, you know, someone can see where they're going, but it's not, you know, um, offensive. It's not going into someone's home or, you know, just basically making it safe to walk on the sidewalks, especially, you know, when the weather gets icy and now we've lost the daylight earlier. Yeah, so um, I'm. I was going to try to pull up the map. I don't know, Mandy, if you have it in front of me, but one of the in front of you. Sorry, um, I just made tea with cold water. So if that gives you any indication on how much uh, caught up I am from from this week, um, it, one of the things to note here is that the way to do that is is through those fixtures, right? So it's through the shielding and the uh, and ensuring that we're not spreading the light into people's homes that it is staying down over the sidewalk. Um, and the downtown area is one that would remain relatively well lit up um, and so or very well lit up really. Um, thank you, Mandy. So it's one of the places with streetscape lighting. Uh, and part of that is for the reasons you just said is the number of sidewalks. Awesome. Okay, yeah. so, so I would add that this is an area that when I was initially drafting this before, you know, I, I talked to Anna and Anna came on board as a co-sponsor, I struggled with, and I think when Anna and I began talking, we also struggled with how do we, how do we know what streets have heavy foot traffic and how heavy that is and how frequently do you need lights for that area? Um, some of the concerns and some of the problems, and this is where we might need um, help from Guilford or someone who knows distance needs, right? The, the distance of a, between lights depends on how high they get mounted. It depends on how strong they are. And so it's, it's really hard to say, well, this area only needs this distance because it depends on all of those things. But it also depends on which side of the street the light is mounted on versus where the sidewalk is. And I think that might be some of our problems. And so it's where when we talk about where lights are needed and, and look at this map and try to figure out how do, you, how do we designate certain zones um, and the zones are how we've tried to figure, you know, how we've tried to say this zone doesn't need as much lighting as this zone. And so this yellow zone um, in the downtown district we've said needs a lot of lighting, the orange needs a little less, but still decent amount because there's still walking going on there. And the purple area doesn't need as much. There's not as much walking going on, especially out, outside of the major thoroughfares. Um, but we might have some of those streets wrong and there might be major thoroughfares for foot traffic that are not for road traffic. And so, um, it's probably something that we need to look street by street for. We tried to do it by the D, the mass DOT um, designations of arterial collector and residential streets. Um, that might not be the right way to do it because there might those are based on cars. If we're looking at foot traffic, we might have to look at other designations because of where apartment complexes say are and where bus stops are. So that's not really a good answer, Anika, I would say. Um, but maybe we look at needing different zones, right? Or an extra zone for sidewalk lighting, right? There's different ways we could do it depending on what the committee wants, what seems more natural. Sidewalk lighting could have a maximum, you know, sort of be more lower, right? If we were going to install specific poles versus if we were going to use um, the telephone poles that are on the other side of the street. So I think it's something that probably needs explored a little more um, to get right. Um, Andy? Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, I had a number of questions and hesitations about this, which I'll get into as I go along. 
My understanding from the Tracy thing to give the simple answer is that um, Eversource putting in taller uh, lighting uh, our electric poles and then remounting the uh, lights has been uh, on taller poles, putting the lights higher. And uh, I, that, that's in my recollection of what she said was. Um, <clears throat> but in any event, I was curious uh, in, from what James said about how this is so spectacular. Had, in your research, have you found any other community, similar community that has a bylaw or ordinance similar to what you're proposing here? So that's kind of the first question, or did you just create something that would make us unique in a model? Well, I love the idea of us being a total uh, trendsetter. We are not in this case. Um, there are other communities that have done very similar, um, very similar bylaws. And I'm, man, I know Pepperell is one. Um, Mandy, do you have, the, and, or James, do you have the other examples on the closer tip of your tongue? Or do you want, I can pull up my sheet somewhere. Yeah, I could I could give you a long list of uh, of cities and towns in Massachusetts that have some kind of lighting bylaw. Um, some of them are um, are quite old and out of date, and in that sense, Amherst is ahead of the ball. Uh, but uh, in fact, um, uh, we have this very active chapter, as I mentioned, of the International Dark Sky Association, uh, and we get requests practically weekly for advice from cities and towns among the 350 cities and towns in Massachusetts for help in crafting and enforcing bylaws. Uh, so, so in fact, what you see uh, in the Amherst product is an effort that uh, is ongoing all around the state and around the country. And uh, we've been in close touch with each other about the Amherst one. And what you see is actually quite similar. It has many elements of the statewide model bylaw that we've been working on for the last year or so um, and and sort of shopping it around to various towns and communities as they ask for for advice. So there are many elements here that are, that are already appearing in other cities and towns bylaws. Okay, uh, I think the second question that I was just generally pondering is that when this was introduced at the council and referred to TSO, we received a lot of public comment and it was a lot of public comment that had uh, varied opinions, but significant amount of public comment that had concerns about change in um, opposition because of uh, feeling that either they don't have a problem or that they're concerned about safety of loss of lighting. So I was curious whether you had been responding to any um, so significant number, I'll put it that way, significant number of citizen complaints when you uh, proposed, uh, started working on this. So I think one of the things that um, I've been saying to folks who have had concerns is that this is why we have this process, right? Is that we are going to work through this committee and then when it goes back to the council um, to to figure out a way to um, reach that that balance and while mandy and i think our bylaw is very good you know that we are two people and i'm sure that there are perspectives that we're not seeing and and we're going to hear those so um that's that is my response to that i mean i also think that there's um I think you said it really well, right? Like this is change and and Anika talked about this before too. And, and so there's some of this that is, uh, some of this that is making sure that we are doing the safest, uh, the safest and most responsible option for the health of our community. And, um, you know, also supporting people who, who are concerned and talking through that with them. So I know that's, I guess that's me responding to how I have, worked with people on that. Um, Mandy, I don't know if you have a separate, a different answer or anything to add. Um, all I would add is we did get a significant number of public comments that were specifically concerned about where the lights go. Yeah. That they didn't seem to be as, I didn't read many that were concerned about the specification proposals. Yeah. Um, 
And in fact, some said, I support the specification proposals, but I don't like your choices on where they go. Yep. Um, and so that's why I think we've been approaching this conversation with you as it's sort of two separate sides. And we recognize that the side about placement is probably a more uh, extensive discussion mm -hmm. um, because it gets so specific. Um, and that might be where we need to talk to you know, James and Guilford and just sort of work through some of those concerns and, and what it is. I, I would like to see if James has any experience with some of the other towns like Pepperell, if they've seen any type of, um, I know North Hampton, Hampton's been working on stuff too, but seen any type of, if there was reductions in adopting sort of these dark sky street lighting proposals, were there reductions in street light placement? And if so, what was sort of the response to that? And I don't know, I personally don't know that answer, but I don't know if James does. In general, the street lights around Massachusetts and most of the Northeast are in uh, locations that have very little to do with science or uh, evidence-based consideration. This, the, the street lights, for the most part, are put on poles whose spacing uh, was determined 100 years ago by how heavy the telegraph wires were. And uh, the poles were set so that the certain, there, was a, there would be a, a maximum amount of sag in the weight of the, the, tele, the telegraph wires. And that turned into telephones and so on and so on. And the poles have just stayed where they are. And then we put the lights on the poles that existed. It had nothing to do with actually scoping out what the needs are. Uh, so it's really, it's, it's practically random. And then there has developed on top of that layers of industry uh, habit, also poorly informed by science. Uh, so really, for the most part, it, it it's really a it's, a, it's a seat of the pants process. And I suspect that the same thing has happened in Amherst. Uh, so the, the reaction, the, the process has been, it's gotten somewhat more uh, regularized in some towns that have looked at it hard, but still not much. For the most part, the, the basic question is, well, do we, you know, do we like this light or do we like that light? And they go on the same kind of poll that they were on before. There has not been dramatic change. So, some other places, Vermont, for example, the state of Vermont uh, encouraged cities and towns to do a lighting audit where uh, they would actually go through and on a, on a light by light basis, uh, assess whether this light is actually needed for safety. Is it is it overlit? Is it underlit? And for the most part, that resulted in something like a 75% reduction in the amount of lighting that was almost always determined that it was overlit compared to the uh, the safety needs. Uh, Northampton went through that process about 25 years ago, but it hasn't that hasn't, hasn't done it since then. Thank you, Andy. Do you have any? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I have one more piece to go into, but. Uh, we actually did go through a process in Amherst. People not, were not particularly always satisfied with the process, but uh, when we were trying to do budget cuts back in 2007, 2008, one of the things that was done was to try and reduce the amount of light street lights in order to um, save money in the budget. And uh, there was a reduction in uh, street lights there. And uh, I'm not sure that people have ever been satisfied because uh, I've observed complaints on both sides, too many and too few, which is, I think, what Mandy's concerned about. If we get stuck on that, we could be going into something that uh, we've been bought into for years. But the other thing that um, I wanted to uh, yield the floor to my colleagues, so I'm going to just go one other concern. The, the, Finance Committee was also a referred uh, a referral point from the council meeting. And so as chair of the Finance Committee, uh, I just recognized that uh, by and large, it's uh, our experience is better to let the other committee that got the referral, in this case, TSO, uh, work it through first, because if you're going to look at costs, you might as well look at the cost of what's actually coming through and not jump the gun on it. But I do have several concerns. One is that you keep mentioning, you need Guilford to do this, you need Guilford to do that. And it gets into this question that I'm concerned about with the next bylaw we'll talk about too, 
but I think it's, you know, I've given some thought to it also as to how to pay for it. Um, staff time um, is a resource and it's really the town manager who makes the decision as to um, how the staff allocates time. Uh, but if we make a request to, to the manager that carries a lot of weight in his decision. And if there's a tremendous amount of staff time, his or other staff, because he has other, Guilford has other people working on street lighting issues, <clears throat> it still um, is a demand on staff time. And staff time is cost. Then there's the question that I have, and I don't know if he's given any thought to these issues, which is why I'm bringing them up today, uh, is just to, whether you've thought about it thought about these questions too, is whether there are other kinds of costs that would be required in the development of the policy. And then you get into the question of whether there are purchases that are necessary of significant amounts uh, and whether there's you, there are capital costs. And uh, I, I'm very concerned that we keep adopting bylaws that require, and I've said this to Mandy in con other contexts, that we keep putting in uh, bylaws that have costs inherent in their implementation. And if we don't think about how it's gonna be paid for, um, then um, it puts further stress on what we've identified as an extremely stressed budget. Um, so I don't know if you've, uh, you did any thinking about that or if you decided to put that off for later as you were developing, because if you've done thought about it, it'd be helpful to know. So do you want me to try, Anna? Yes, please. You go so, first. We did think a little. We did. We, we did. Um, and, and in fact, Paul was kind enough to um, provide a meeting with Guilford and himself and I. I'm, I don't remember whether Anna, I think you were there, but maybe not. Yeah. Um, and and so some of the information we received from that meeting was that the last time that a total relamping of the town was done, um, which was the sodium and mercuries to the LEDs, um, that it took two years to complete the whole process. Um, and that that, you know, our original draft had an actual schedule and had some things about if the lights don't meet it, then a resident, if once this passes, can immediately ask for it to be shut off or this or that. And we got some recommendations from Paul and Guilford that said, you know, that's a recipe for a lot of confusion and a lot of extra work because it would have DPW going all sorts of ends of towns at all different times, and it's just not very efficient. And so the recommendation there was to remove some of that scheduling from the policy itself and just ask um, for it to be scheduled after the policy is adopted by DPW, who would then report to the town council um, on that schedule. And they reported, you know, they, they said that a five year sort of implementation was a logical implementation to work it into budgets and capital plans. Um, in sitting on JCPC, I think Andy. Um, you weren't on it last year, Anna was, and Kathy and I. And one of the things last year in 2022, the spring JCPC process, we asked, um, I had asked Guilford and some of the other department heads if there was anything in the capital, you know, that they were thinking of in the next couple of years that wasn't in the capital program as proposed. And one of the things Guilford mentioned last spring was relamping of the town. And so, you know, I haven't explored that, but the LED lights went in a while ago. And so it might be that we're almost to the point where those LEDs need replaced anyway. Um, Paul and Guilford would have a better idea of that, but he mentioned that on his own without me like prompting anything of, are we gonna need a relamping anytime soon? And so I think it's already on his mind that, that it might be close to the time for getting new lights. And if that is close to the time, it makes a lot of sense to have a new policy in place that talks about all of this at the same time. Um, I don't know the cost. Um, the cost, depending on how many street lights 
um, get removed, I would say, is directly related then to the cost to the town for replacing all the rest with compliant lights based on the policy that's adopted. If we end up removing 50% of the lights, we're not paying, not only are we not paying to replace those with the new compliant lighting fixtures, we're not paying to light those lights either. Um, and so it's hard to estimate cost without necessarily knowing exactly how many lights we would need to relamp. It looks like James might also have yeah, some. I say, yeah. But I see other people are in line. That's okay, James, you get to cut if you're answering the question. <laughs> Okay, regarding the cost, uh, just to echo what uh, what Mandy Joe just said, uh, uh, there are a couple of potential cost savings. Of course, there are uh, potential uh, costs if you had to if you decided to relamp the whole town. But what's nice about the proposed policy is the forward looking nature of it. Uh, just anticipating that there are always going to be ongoing needs on an ongoing basis to install and to replace lamps. And the question is, uh, can you get ahead of the decisions so that the right ones go in? And when you have the chance and the money to replace, you can replace, but they're uh, uh, proactively, but there are always going to be lamps that are burning out and need to be replaced or new places or new development. And it, in fact, it's, uh, it's often assumed that uh, better lights are going to be fancier and more expensive. It's not true. Uh, not all LEDs are the same. If you put in LED lights, uh, you have a wide range of choices. And uh, for example, Pepperell, which has been mentioned already, uh, chose to um, uh, to uh, do a public demonstration of a wide range of street lights. And universally, people chose the one that was not only uh, the most compliant in the same way that the policy proposes, which is to say the best shielded, the lights went down only instead of out. They were the lowest intensity, not the brightest ones. And they were the the, the warmest colors, 2200 Kelvin instead of super blue, like Amherst's current 4000 Kelvin, uh, with, where the AMA, American Medical Association, recommends no more than 3000. Um, so there was, a, there was an assumption going in Oh, the 4,000 ones are going to be cheaper. The 2,200 better color ones are going to be more expensive. It was exactly the opposite. So it turned out people uniformly uh, chose the one that was um, not only the best for reducing light pollution, reducing the effects on human health, reducing the effects on wildlife. They were also the least expensive ones to install. And uh, the, the town wound up using 83% less electricity than they had been using before, uh, which was 20% better than they were going to do. If they hadn't, uh, if they hadn't made those those different choices, so those are all opportunities for cost savings. I I can talk more about the tariff structure and EverSource and National Grid and the the utilities uh, if you like. The bottom line is, until the state changes its policy, you're not going to see, unfortunately, uh, the uh, the benefits that you should from uh, from putting in lower uh, levels of of wattages. Uh, you're probably paying for a minimum of 25 watts, even if you use less than 25. That's unfortunate, and we're trying to change that at the state level. Thanks, James. Shalini? Well, first, thank you, James, for hanging out with us, <laughs> choosing to be with us. Uh, continuing with the theme of, um, no, I'll do the cost later, but I had a question for you, James, whether there was some kind of a ranking or available for where AMRA stands with respect to night, night pop pollution, because that would give us a sense of the urgency um, with which we need to act in terms of the impact on the environment, human health. So that's the first question. Yes, um, uh, uh, the, let's see, um, shall I share screen? Would that be possible, if you wouldn't mind? Yeah, I think, I think you should be able to. Yes, I can. And uh, oops, has failed. Screen sharing has failed to start. That's mm -hmm. funny. Uh, let me try it again. Does he need administration access or something? Nope. Oh, here we go. Yeah. There we go. All right. Um, this is uh, a website called lightpollutionmap.info. And it has the entire world. So here's the whole world in light pollution. And if we zoom in on Massachusetts and Amherst, you'll see the color coding shows uh, the light pollution as uh, reflected in the brightness of the night sky. 
Uh, the sky should be a uniformly dark blue color uh, or, or actually black. This would be pristine. This is up in the Adirondacks. And you'll see that Massachusetts is the opposite. Boston is the brightest. Uh, the white is the worst. Uh, then red, then, uh, then down to this dark blue. And in Amherst, if we zoom in here, you'll see that the worst of it is uh, UMass. And if we click there, you get more information that's quantitative. And this ratio here, 11, means that uh, the sky, the natural, the dark, the night sky is 11 times brighter than the naturally dark sky. A naturally dark sky is not actually zero uh, darkness. There's a little bit of, of light, uh, to natural sky glow. Uh, uh, at that position, it's 11 times brighter. Uh, you can see some other numbers here. These are astronomer units. Um, this Bortle class six, uh, that's on a scale of one to nine, where one is the pristine, dark, unpolluted sky and nine is uh, New York City and Las Vegas, Times Square. Uh, so class six is, is not great. Uh, and um, there are various ramifications there that uh, we can go into in the, the literature for what the, the implications for human health are, um, uh, but it's, um, it is cause for concern. Could we quickly look at other areas? Because UMass, I don't know how much control we have over them, but could we look like in South Amherst, that's where I am. Sure. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, right there. Sure. If I click right there, you'll see the ratio is down to 2.78, yeah. and it's border class four. Good. Right. Over here. Right. Much better. Right. I mean, much better, but border class four is still not <laughs> great. We're pretty yellow. <laughs> it's, it's, still, it's still orange, right? Um, There's room. 2.78 and one. It wasn't it one, two, nine. The Bortle class, the Bortle scale is one to nine. Yes, it, it, it uh, right. It, it's uh, it's it's all relative. There's there's definitely room for improvement here, and uh, it, uh, there, in addition to the numbers that we just looked at, uh, there is a an international certification procedure for uh, uh, cities and towns and communities to get certified as inter as international dark sky communities. Um, Amherst would have a very, very hard time. Amherst is not in a position to be applying for that status right now. In order to be considered, you have to demonstrate not only have you passed the bylaws, uh, but that you're reducing the, the, the amount of light pollution as measured in, uh, in ways that we just saw, uh, and a number of other criteria that, that Amherst is nowhere near at this point. Um, so those are the two, the, the two sort of quantitative answers I would, I would give you off the top of my head. One, this... Um, uh, global accounting, and then to the certification procedure. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that does make me feel that UMass is the bigger contributor, and I don't know if you have any control over them. Um, the other question... I had something else coming up, but which I can't remember right now, but I'll go to the other questions meanwhile. So when we talk about, you know, our current our town right now, and it may need changing of lights, and it makes sense that if you're going to change lights, why not change towards the better ones? But our when we're talking about changing lights, and let's say we pass this bylaw and we have to adapt to this new is it just the switching out of the light and saying okay instead of this bad light let's put this but what i'm hearing is it's the fixture itself so it's not just switching out lights it sounds like it would require a change in the actual fixture or is that not correct it might it depends on the uh on the problem so it might mean changing the fixture to add more shielding it might mean changing the bulb so it's more than just changing the light. It's not like, hey, we're going to change the light, so why not switch to better? It might. It's actually a more involved process. Um, I mean, I guess it depends on how you define involved, like on a scale of one to nine. I'm not sure. But uh, how I'm defining involved is, does it involve just a switching of the light, or does it involve the switching of the actual fixtures and then the time and cost associated 
with that. Sure. So I, I mean, I've never done it myself, so I don't know the, the time, but um, I, we, we were looking into the cost of it. I believe that was one of our questions when we were talking with Guilford. Um, so yes, for some of them, it would just be switching out the light bulb, like the light itself. For some of them, it would mean switching the fixture out. Um, and those were, those were some of the considerations that we were speaking with Guilford about. Mandy, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I mean, I would say for certain of the specifications in the, and, and James may be able to help, but for certain of the specifications, like the color temperature, well, that's fixed with a new bulb, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and and many of our street lights, um, the Cobra lights specifically, don't have any up lighting, um, but they're not really well shielded, despite not having up lighting. Um, they they you know they don't necessarily direct it only to the places we want, and so. I, what we can't answer is could a shield be, it, are there shields out there? And I think there are that would allow us to direct even on those Cobra fixtures that we have right now, which are the fixtures that are on most of the um, light poles. Like if you're looking at light pole fixtures, um, street, you know, yeah, um, telephone pole fixtures. Um, and could we put a shield on? I don't know how much that shield costs. Um, it's It's something that, it depends on what the specifications that are passed are, which is why it's hard to answer the question. Um, because if the specifications are passed that don't require shielding, say, if that, if TSO and, and we end up eliminating that, I would not argue to eliminate that, but if that ends up being eliminated, well, then the costs might be different. And so it, it becomes a very hard answer to provide. Um, you know, the downtown street lighting lamps are not the greatest, but can some of them be modified in a way where you don't have to buy a new complete fixture? Probably. Um, but again, it all depends on the specs that end up in the policy. Yeah, I guess um, I would still I would just echo Andy's concerns that you know we are putting in town council time, we're putting town staff time and and money and resources into it. So it's not that it's not urgent, but it's like where do we put this when we have? And then I know James, you said there'll always be concerns, but you know when there is safety concerns around speeding and potholes and sidewalks, and we're trying to make it a bikeable, bikeable street. So do we divert our funds into doing those things or this when we're seeing that the 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 pollution is on a scale of one to nine, whatever that ratio was like, we're two. Do we really need to spend that time now or like should we just keep a lookout for it and then work with UMass meanwhile to get them to get their stuff down. Um, so that's kind of the question around process and and the other I think part of our process is to uh, go through town manager goals so that's another place where we could maybe get a sense of where the Council is on how urgent do we think this issue is. Uh, if I could respond just just briefly to that. Um, so if the concern is some of that, uh, part of what I would say as a sponsor is put the policy in place, but allow a longer um, implementation period where if it's it, where it's long enough such that the town would be relamping all the lamps anyway because then the money would already would, would be in the capital like it wouldn't be an additional or an increased cost quicker does that make it, i'm trying to say you know if the relamping's supposed to be in 7 years and we adopt this policy that says 5 well maybe if we extend to 7 then it's harder to say the costs are not are are not something we should be doing right because then we'd be doing the relamping at the time we would have been doing it anyway but if we don't put the policy in place at all, in seven years when that relamping comes up, we're relamping with bad lights mm -hmm. um, and bad. So, so that's part of what I would say. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, I, I, I thank James for that light pollution map. Um, fascinating. So the Bortle scale runs one to nine. Nowhere in Amherst is less than a four. 
Um, so, so that 2.76 is multiple times of a dark, a dark sky, but the four is how bad it is on a one to nine scale. Um, and so yellow is not the greatest to be, especially if we're trying to not have health effects for humans and animals. And we need to think about town council policies on health and safety that doesn't just relate to COVID health. It doesn't just relate to um, you know, public safety, safety as we think about it. It does relate to the health of all the residents in town as light pollution, sound pollution, noise pollution, you know, that that all goes back to health. So I would just, you know, and that is one of our policy goals right now, community health and safety. Um, and so it, a, a case can be made that this serves that purpose. And then the other thing I would say, which James may be able to speak a little bit more on, um, it may also serve a social justice purpose. Um, and and I, I can't say definitely it does, but in many areas, the brightest areas that have the most light pollution are in those areas that have the lowest income individuals um, for whatever reason. And so fixing the lights so that their health, you know, you can argue that that uh, dealing with a new lighting policy um, addresses some social justice issues that we don't necessarily think of. You know, one of the reasons I started out on this was because there's a lot of complaints that I was getting, we were getting as councils, we were getting some significant complaints from a person on Chestnut Street, um, you know, and, and some of the downtown areas, um, some of those areas have low income housing and moderate income housing and affordable housing. Um, you know, bus stops where we want lighting, a lot of times are near apartment complexes. It's not just that our moderate and low income individuals live only in apartment complexes, but a lot of people live there. And if we over light it, we're affecting a lot more people. And so I would encourage us to think about what lighting does on a social justice is on a community health scale, both of which are council goals um, and priorities on policy. Can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah, so, go ahead. Thank you. So uh, if one thing I heard was if the relamp, so I, I think the question is when, one of the questions is the relamping, when is that gonna happen in our town? And if it's happening in seven years, then maybe we don't need to start working on this bylaw right now. Let's schedule it down for three years into it because right now we could work on what seems to be more urgent. And of course, that's again for the town council to decide collectively when we set our town manager goals that these are the priorities we're seeing for this coming year in terms of town staff, time, town time, and resources, right? So that's one thing. The second thing I was curious was, and that was the question I had when I was looking at those, uh, the map was, are there separate standards for like a downtown versus neighborhood areas? Because downtown automatically has more businesses and all. So I can imagine those lights could also be improved so they're downwards and not up in the sky, but does that threshold still change between neighborhoods and downtowns. Sorry, is that question for me or for, for me? Ah, um, in fact, there's no such thing as a standard. There are no standards. You could turn off all the lights in Amherst mm -hmm. and, uh, and it would not violate any law. It's entirely um, uh, organically developed and by habit, by long habit and uh, by mission creep. And uh, there is there is no law in uh, anywhere in the country that would uh, that would require you to uh, actually light the roads uh, and the and the sidewalks. That's not what we're proposing here. We're, <laughs> we're propo and you know it's not the International Dark Ground Society. It's the International Dark Sky Society. Right. We're proposing to make good lights instead of bad lights. And um, in general, there is a, a tacit or even explicit assumption that more densely populated areas are going to have more light and that is a little bit fraught it is natural it's the way things have evolved but it does uh, introduce the problem that mandy mentioned which is the issue of social justice um, why should people who live in big cities i grew up in new york city myself 
Uh, why should people who live in big cities be subject to more light pollution, which is ex which is demonstrably bad for their health, uh, demonstrably linked to higher rates of uh, of uh, hormonal cancers and diabetes and obesity and sleep disruption and mood disorder in adolescents? And this is according to studies with hundreds of thousands of subjects around the world in the United States and in, in Spain and in Korea, uh, repeated by by many studies. Uh, so it's uh, and uh, as Mandy mentioned, there is a, a strong correlation of overlighting with uh, under-resourced populations. Uh, African Americans around uh, the country are subject to surveillance lighting, which is explicitly bad for their um, for their health. Uh, I don't know anything about how that's happening or not happening in Amherst. That it, it's a it, it's a uh, a larger context issue. Yeah, so I just want to clarify, I wasn't talking about overcrowded places should have more light, but just downtown seems like you're gathering for outdoor dining. So it seems like you will need more lighting to navigate the spaces for shopping and all. Um, but um, what I was going to say is that some, yeah, like, I don't know if, uh, James, you got a copy of this email, probably not. We should send it to you, though that one of our constituents sent us this um, statistics of the numbers. And so 76 of the pedestrians who died after being struck by a vehicle were killed at night. So there is, I mean, some of that creep and fear is based on what the numbers and statistics and 2004, since 2014, nighttime pedestrian deaths have risen by 41%. Uh, low income people and people of color are overrepresented in pedestrian deaths relative to their proportions in the population. So, I mean, there are like all these, you know, type of different data that are out there. So, um, I mean, I'm totally with you though, that we, you know, we shouldn't be uh, for over surveillance and things like that. That should definitely, um, yeah, go ahead. If you wouldn't mind, if I could respond to that, I, 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 I I would love to actually dive into those statistics more. So thank you for mentioning it. And I, I would like to uh, get more familiar with that particular study that you cited. My my off the cuff response would be um, that, uh, again, there's good light and there's bad light. And if the flashlight is shining in your eyes, that's bad light. And that's the way the great majority of lights are, including in Amherst. Uh, so I'm not surprised that uh, that pedestrian fatalities at night are up. Uh, just as the amount, I mean, you cannot go anywhere in America now, including in Amherst, without you know, drive around at night or walk or bike around at night without being poked in the eye by new bad lights on people's porches, on their uh, in their driveways, in at, uh, um, commercial parking lots, uh, and the city's lights. So the great majority of lights that are going in now, which are all L uh, LEDs, it's all provided by this LED revolution, are bad. They're poorly shielded. And it's counterproductive. So just as as we heard earlier from uh, Dorothy Pam, uh, uh, people driving around at night who are uh, complaining about the bad uh, about their their inability to see, for the most part, uh, those of us working in this field strongly believe, and I think there's strong evidence that it, it's not uh, it's not just in their minds. It's that there are bad lights out there, and especially for the elderly whose uh, eyes become less transparent. They're more subject to glare. Glare is the culprit. So if we're if we're concerned about pedestrian safety, the way to solve that with lighting in any way to address it with lighting is to make sure that the light goes down only on the crosswalk and not out sideways into the driver's eyes. And uh, that's a problem that we uh, we certainly see here in Northampton. The cross light, the crosswalk has a, a a street light nearby it, and the light goes out at a very very shallow angle. Uh, not up into the sky, but out sideways, which means it's necessarily dry, uh, shining right into the to the eyes of drivers. And that's exactly the opposite of what we should do. The light should go very narrowly down on the crosswalk. So I'm going to, um, oh, sorry, Mandy, go ahead. I was just going to say some other questions. Yeah. I was just going to answer Shalini's question about downtown. It's, yeah. it's why we have this map right um and these lighting zones and recognizing that that those pedestrians those high pedestrian areas might need a different type of light um that streetscape lighting district or something but it's also some in the policy we've proposed in some of those districts we've proposed lowering those lights to a very low level 
um, once the retail shops are closed, right? There's other ways to think about this to say, you know, when people are out on those sidewalks, we need light. But once the, once the shops are all closed in that area, well, there are not going to be as many people out there. And so we don't need as much light because no one's shopping or no one's dining or no one's there. They might be traveling through because it might still be a bus stop and people might live there, right? So, so you can reduce the amount of light, which then serves that social justice and other types of purposes of helping the humans that happen to live in those areas have a darker baseline for the time they're sleeping. So we have two other questions um, and I know we have other things on our agenda tonight. So I'm gonna go to these two questions and this will be an ongoing conversation um, with TSO for, for a while. So thank you, um, but let's go to Dorothy and Andy, but I am gonna cut it off there. And then if folks have other questions, please email them to Mandy and I, we'll get them to James. And um, that way we can come with answers as well and, and hopefully go, go even quicker next time. Um, Dorothy. Okay. So I am speaking in support of the type of light, the height of the light, the placement of the light, the shielding of the light, but not at this time, the reducing of the number of fixtures. Um, so um, I wanna clarify a few things. The poles, the uh, electrical poles, utility poles, are they placed on the side of the street? If a street has a sidewalk on one side, is there a policy of having those poles on the non-sidewalk side? I don't know the answer to that. Um, yeah, because uh, I think that was a very important point was made that the light should be on the sidewalk side. I believe the light yeah. should go down on the sidewalk. So that's something I would like to see looked into. Um, Can then, I pause, Dorothy? Because I think Paul has an answer for you oh, okay, on that one. Great. Yeah, I, I think James answered that earlier that the poles were placed by convenience. It wasn't organized around sidewalks being placed. And unless you have a planned community, it might've been done or, or a okay. subdivision. Okay. Thank you. So I can see doing certain things in anticipation of replacing poles in some time in the future, which is to block by block, decide where is the best placement of the pole for pedestrians, okay? Um, but then I thought when that part happens, if that part ever happens, who pays for all these new poles? I mean, we've been watching this ma massive undertaking of the utilities replacing poles and then leaving two poles in one spot. And as I say, making the lights go higher. So they've just been doing what they've been doing, um, maybe with or without, without much supervision by the town, I don't know. Um, but uh, I did wanna say that people don't just walk on streets with sidewalks. People who own dogs, I am not a dog owner, but if you have a dog, you've got to walk that dog and you have to walk that dog at night. And that's why my friend Evelyn Goldberg has been paying for a streetlight that was going to be cut off during that budget crunch. She's been paying for over 20 years for that streetlight because she was widowed and had to walk the dog herself alone at night. And she felt not safe. So I, I think that we need to remember that it's not just on sidewalks that we light. People who live in residential areas do have to get out and do some things on, on by foot. Um, so um, let's see. And we already talked about UMass. I agree. When I come by, when I come down and see the campus all lit up with these high bright lights, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm sure we don't have much control over it, but whenever we get a chance to talk to them about whenever they're ready to talk to us, I think that's something that could be talked about. Um, yeah. So I think that for the part two, the, re the reducing of light or whatever, besides finding out where they should go in, in a rational system, if one were going to replace them at some point, this is the poles, okay? That that's where the O in TSO comes in, which is outreach. And that I think would be truthfully block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, mm -hmm. because I think that's where you'll find out what should be done. So my recommendation is that we follow the through with parts that relate to changing the fixtures and the bulbs, which as, some, as was pointed out, we have to do it now and then anyway. So put the better stuff in when you have to change individual fixtures. Um, and then in terms of if there's gonna be more in the future, it should only come from neighborhood input, block by block outreach that we could do. And we'll find that many blocks are different. Um, I, it's very interesting hearing that after a rational plan is done, 
that the light is reduced these huge amounts. Maybe that's true. I don't know. Um, I'm just not going to go ahead and assume that it's true. I would have to see that it's true. Okay. And I think that we would have to do it with our neighborhoods because people do have reasonable expectations of safety on their blocks. And I think most people agree we don't want overlighting, but we don't want underlighting either. So, I mean, I think we could do a little bit, a little start on this, but hold off on the second part and get some thoughts about planning on that. So that's my thoughts. Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, Andy? Yeah, uh, just real briefly on, you know, we were talking about social policy issues and it made me think of about the topic, <clears throat> excuse me, that I had brought up way back on when I was first introduced to the council, I brought it up with Mandy. And that is that um, there's a program that the police department have been, has been involved in for you know, a number of years now called SEPTED, which is Community Policing Through Environmental Design. And uh, the whole idea is that um, the SEPTED team that looks at where there are um, safety problems that require police department intervention um, or at least uh, on a frequent basis to look at the environment and make sure the environment is safe. And frequently um, where there's uh, problems of uh, the, that require police attention, there are also, those are also problems of low lighting or other visibility blockage. Uh, as well as access blockage. And all those kinds of things are environmental issues that can be modified and make an area um, easier for the police to assure safety and make them just safer areas. Uh, the person in the police department who has worked on this uh, most that I'm aware of is Bill Laramie. And, uh, I, when Bill has, uh, came to the select board back in my days of still having a select board, um, a lot of his requests were coming in. And I think that uh, Captain Gunderson, who's now chief in South Hadley, uh, would also make these requests. They're frequently around um, providing more lighting in very specific areas um, and lighting that was adequate to serve the purpose that the SEPTEB team, team had devised. So um, I report that to, um, because I think that there may be something that's going, you know, some interrelationship that some people would argue has to do with social policy, but I would be hesitant to get into this without, uh, you know, with the permission of the town manager and the police chief inviting um, Officer Laramie and to talk to this committee about his um, observations about necessity for lighting for um, the reasons that the SEPTED program was created. Thanks, Andy. Um, James, I think you're gonna say what I think you're gonna say. So um, I'm gonna let you go ahead. I just wanna throw out there really quickly that there's a significant amount of data that demonstrates that street lighting has no impact on increases in crime or safety. Uh, I mean, it's crime-based that kind of th stuff. James, go ahead. Thanks, uh, Anna. Yes, exactly. There, there's a lot to say about that. I'm sure um, uh, we could have a very rich discussion about that. Uh, but what you just said is is absolutely true. And uh, I would love to tell you about my uh, Toyota Prius that's been vandalized twice uh, on the street right outside my house, directly underneath the street light, the very bright street light, which is just a, a typical example. But specifically about SEPTED, SEPTED uh, does have ex explicit uh, advice about lighting. And it's actually um, significantly uh, more nuanced than just, um, you know, more light is better. Uh, so uh, it might be a, a really interesting idea to have one of the national SEPTED experts come and discuss with Amherst. They're very uh, sensitive to the, the context and lighting is, is, should be that way. Lighting should reflect the, the local contextual needs and not just be a knee jerk. We need more light all the time. Uh, so I think uh, SEPTED has a, a fairly nuanced perspective on that. Great. Um, I want to thank James for joining us today. And um, thank you. Thank you so much. 
Um, we're truly like, I want to just impress upon people that we are hearing from one of the foremost experts in this field right now. So um, I'm, I'm appreciative to for coming out this evening. Uh, and we will continue to talk on this. We've gotten your questions down. If you have more of them, please send them to us. We'll keep working on them. And we will be back um, whenever Anika wants to let us back on the, the agenda. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I know I, I, I look forward. I, I do agree. I think that this is um, this has been really interesting. And I, I hope that, um, you know, there will be a lot of public input with this, especially in regards to like around when people go to bed and all that, just because people have a variety of schedules and opinions. Thank you all so much uh, for being here. And James, you're welcome to stay with us. If not, we'll say thank you and, and uh, good night. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. We did, Athena, if we could, we did go a little, uh, a bit over and- I'm realizing we should I, say bye to I, Mandy too, sorry. Yeah. Oh, I'm but sorry, Mandy. I forgot she's not on TSO. Bye, Mandy. I, I Mandy, I'm so used to being here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mandy. Um, and would it be okay, just as we went a bit over, that we could ask if we have anyone in the audience that would like to make a public comment and move that up because we've gone a bit uh, longer than uh, we expected. If there is anyone in the audience that would like to make a public comment at this time, could you please raise your hand? Okay, um, I see we have two, Athena. Could we bring um, Nancy Eddy in the room? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, I have to tell you, it's a great pleasure to watch all of you working so hard. While I am nicely retired and quietly uh, watching you all, um, I, I will just make a brief comment because I will put my thoughts in, in writing to you, but I, I have watched two of James's very professional uh, discussions and presentations on this subject, and I have now read a good deal about the subject, and I am delighted that Mandy Jo and Anna have come up with a bylaw, which I think would serve us very well in the future. And I really hope that the uh, council will ad adopt it. I have no question, no comments about where the streetlights should be. I will stay out of that altogether. You guys can all deal with that. And I will uh, watch with, with humor as you, <laughs> as you try to, to thread the needle as best you can. But having a right bylaw in place uh, as soon as possible, I think is really a critical thing. And I would look forward to seeing what you all do. Thanks for letting us in. Thank you, Nancy. And then uh, Tracy, Tracy Zepin. Hello. Okay, hi. Um, so I did write, I didn't realize it was late. I only realized this was on the agenda a few days ago. And um, I'd sort of been watching for it to be on the agenda because I know I'd written comments in the summer to the council and I had gotten some emails from James and I had a lot of thoughts about what he told me and and I wanted to follow up, but I hadn't done it because I was waiting and because life is busy. But um, I mean, I do, you know, when I hear his comments and I'm unfortunate, it's unfortunate that he's already left. I wish I wish because I haven't followed up with him yet. I will follow up with him after this meeting. But when I hear his comments saying that the issues with the safety at night, you know, in terms of older people having more safety issues driving at night and pedestrians getting hit more and killed more at night is because of bad lighting, not because of no lighting. I am skeptical of that. And I am somebody who spent a lot of years looking at traffic safety data. Specifically, I'm not a dark skies expert. I'm not a lighting expert, but I am. I do spend a lot of time with data and looking at crashes. And there are a lot of reasons that there are more crashes at night. And it is predominantly because pedestrians aren't seen at night or bicyclists aren't seen at night. I know, you know, just anecdotally when I drive on this drive, sometimes on the side of the road, particularly if we have a number of neighborhoods here with no sidewalks, um, that there'll be a pedestrian that I don't see until I'm like right next to them or a bicyclist I don't see until I'm right next to them. I mean, that happens. And so that is not a reflection of lighting that's bad lighting. That's a reflection of no lighting. Um, you know, the research shows, as I mentioned in my email today, the research shows that 
drivers overestimate their ability to see bicyclists and pedestrians at night um, and that bicyclists and pedestrians overestimate how visible they are to drivers at night. And so, I mean, there are a lot of safety issues there. Um, you know, I agree with some of what was said, including um, Councillor Pam's proposal about just really separating out the lighting and the lighting fixtures piece from the neighborhood piece and the location of where street lights are. Um, she mentioned Evelyn Goldenberg, who is one of my neighbors. And in 1991-92, the town turned off a number of street lights a good number and um and since then quite a few of those neighborhoods have actually been paying for the street lights themselves because they value continue to have some light in their neighborhood i mean i walk a lot at night and it is dark it is dark even downtown and um and i'm you know i'm fairly young so it doesn't bother me but you know we want to be an age friendly community we want to be a dementia friendly community it's people who are older who don't drive like they, it's still good if they can walk, you know, right now we're in the winter, it gets dark by like four or 430. So we want to have that access. And um, so it's a big concern to me if we're going to turn off the light. So I have, I just have a lot of questions about that part of the policy. And I thought it was a good recommendation coming from the council to split those two pieces. Um, and also just, you know, in terms of, you know, when James is talking, I know he emailed me and he said that he's invited advice Pelham. I know like he lives in Northampton and, but some of the, a number of the communities he's mentioned to me are more rural communities. And I would be really curious about whether he's advised communities that have very large populations of people without cars, people who are dependent on walking for transportation or who are taking buses a lot for transportation because almost anybody who takes a bus is walking to and from the bus stop, right? So, and I, I mean, one of the, and one part of the proposal that I had a lot of um, concerns about is when I look at the map that we have entire sections of Amherst, including residential neighborhoods that would have no street lights at all. And a lot of those neighborhoods are only barely, minimally lit now. Like they only would have, they only currently, because of the lights that what, you know, came off previously, they only currently have lights at intersections within the neighborhood and at cul-de-sacs. And even at my age, I don't always see that well at night. It is helpful, you know, when you're navigating neighborhoods you're not that familiar with, um, to have a little bit of lighting there. Um, there are neighborhoods, you know, where there's a lot of residential lighting, but there are some places that don't have that. And so, you know, when you think about people delivering things at night or whatever, I mean, it does help just to have a little bit. And, you know, Dorothy mentioned um, dog walkers, but I mean, there's a lot of places where people are walking at night and a lot of the, our neighborhoods don't have sidewalks. Um, so just the whole idea that the whole proposal about where the lights would be is like completely just based on the zoning, but also that so many lights are turned off. And to me, it's just that if you are, I mean, I have a lot of questions too, <laughs> like have, I mean, a few examples were mentioned about people who've complained about the lights near their homes, but like have any neighborhoods, have any of our, you know, um, neighborhoods that have the largest environmental justice population, social justice population, have they asked for streetlights to be turned off in their neighborhood? Have they said that they are overlit neighborhoods? I mean, I do think that can happen in urban areas. You know, if you look at like public housing projects and things, I don't hear about it in Amherst. But I think I would agree with the idea that if you want to empower neighborhoods and you want to empower all of our populations, that you go to those populations to see what do they need. If the neighborhood's saying, like, turn off our lights, that's one thing. But if they're saying we want to keep our lights, I mean, I think that deserves consideration, too. Thank you, um, Tracy. You brought up great points that further allow us to know why we really need to involve community input when we're making decisions for how people live and what they want. Thank you so very much for your comment. Uh, and with that, if there is no other comment, I am going to, Anna, I'm going to pass it back over to you for the proposed water and sewer bottle update. A quick update. Uh, Paul, we are, we are, um, okay, so wait, I'm going to try to do it. And can you correct me if I'm wrong? <laughs> so uh, we have sent the, um, the bylaws for legal review. And so we're still waiting back. The KP law had to use a different or chose to use a different um, lawyer. It's one of the advantages of having KP law, but in this case, it means it's taking a little bit longer for us to get it back. And the questions are really just ensuring where we are putting the fine information, whether it's in the policy or what, how we put it in the bylaw um, and, and making sure that it's all aligned. So 
the the too long didn't read version of that is that it, we don't have it right now and we will uh, have it hopefully soon for you. Thank you. Yeah, I made up all the time that I took earlier. <laughs> Thank you. No, it was great. Thank you. Always bringing something that uh, something wonderful to the table. Okay, so with that, I am going to now, uh, Sean and Andy. Do we have anyone that is will be joining us from the audience, or if not, I will go ahead and pass it over to Sean and Andy. Well, I certainly would like to bring in. Uh... Alicia Walker, because she's one of the co-sponsors, the council of co-sponsors, and uh, so I would like okay. to have her in. All right, Athena, could we please bring Alicia Walker in? And I also want to just acknowledge that Darcy Dumont, who's uh, um, one of the resident sponsors from Zero Waste is also in the audience. In case we have any questions, uh, we can always invite her. Okay. And, and there, and there and is Susan. one other person. Yeah, you want to tell? <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, we're so excited that Susan Waite uh, is yes. also here. And the good news that we woke up to, maybe that's why I'm in such good new mood today, is because Paul uh, let us know that uh, they applied and we've been approved the DEB grant. So that means we can work with Susan Waite, who is a Mass DEB um, person, Mac. So she's also an audience today in case we need to draw upon her expertise at this meeting. And you're muted. You're muted. I might have been using a temporary. Uh, in any event, uh, the goals we wanted to try and accomplish um, today um, were several, but we wanted to keep it short, recognizing the, the time. But the first uh, is actually the topic that um, Shalini is. Uh, initially covered and that is that uh, we did uh, find out uh, today that uh, Guilford and Paul had successfully applied for an allocation of time from uh, Mass DEP um, for technical assistance and helping us to evaluate um, what we're trying to achieve and how to go about and achieve it. Um, and. Uh, I don't know if Paul has anything to report to us to um, begin with about the application that um, was actually um, that was filed specifications to it. So that um, is, is uh, initial context for that. Sure. So we learned about 25 hours ago that we, we were selected and we appreciate everybody's advocacy for this. It's been very good. Uh, and just in short, the goal is to expand the work. We are uh, going to be working with Susan Waiten. We have not talked with her since we've received this notification. The goal is to expand on previous work and develop an RFQ or RFI to either collect additional information or develop the qualifications to issue a contract to provide the current services townwide and to implement additional services such as compost, bulk, bulky waste, and or yard waste collection. So that's the type of work we're going to be asking uh, Susan to help us with. And um, and we get 80 hours um, of her time, which is not a lot, but it should be sufficient to meet the needs of because she's very smart and knows the territory and will work efficiently. So that far one, I don't know if there are any questions about that initially, or I'll jump into what I think is uh, probably the meat of the discussion. Uh, and that is that we had um, two things um, going um, that we've been working with and trying to work on as co-sponsors with the help of our partners, including Zero Waste Amherst, which is why um, we might want to um, bring um, in uh, Darcy or Darcy might ask to speak at some time and we should be, I want to be attentive to seeing her hand up if she does, but um, 
we had uh, developed and presented the last time this was discussed in the committee a uh, action plan for the committee and uh, actually if i uh, it might be best if i um, share screen and put it on the screen if you, uh, just to, to remind you of it i trying to remember if we sent it to the committee after it was discussed last time but what we would like to do, if not tonight, at, some, at the next meeting, um, is to actually have the action plan developed because it gives us a roadmap of how we want to uh, proceed. But it is a uh, working document that we're continuing to, uh, to develop. And uh, so as a uh, consequence, uh, you know, it has multiple parts to it and uh, see if I can get to the uh, part that that's uh, most important uh, to be on the screen if we're going to do this and uh, I have to go back to uh, Andy while you're pulling that up can I just make a point sure um, and I, I think Paul, I wonder if it would be helpful for Susan to look at this plan and she might uh, want to provide feedback on it or like if uh, I think the goal is like, how can we support the staff in in this process? And so we had created this work plan to identify what are the questions that are coming up from the counselors and I believe uh, Darcy had collected all the questions that came up during town council and she sent it to us and Andy has incorporated those questions now into this work plan. And so I think forwarding it to Susan would be helpful so she knows what we are thinking and then it would be helpful for us to hear from her whenever she's ready what yeah. that plan would look like. Okay, there's one thing before I put the plan up on the screen just to run through it really quickly is that um, the questions did not get added. That was the point that I made okay. in the er email I'm earlier sorry. today. I'm sorry. Um, but I wanted to acknowledge that, um, that as a separate document, which I know um, is, is not something we've discussed before, uh, Darcy, on behalf of Zero Waste Amherst, had um, identified a um, number of questions and had uh, provided, at least from her perspective and Zero Waste Amherst's perspective, what the answers to those questions might be. And I, you know, I've looked through um, the questions and the answers, and they're actually broken into two sections on the current document that I'm working with. Uh, because there was the original document and then there were additional uh, responses in an email uh, that we just received. And uh, those, uh, um, th there's um, very helpful information, but it, 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 that's the piece that I think probably needs the, mo the most review and comment. Um, and uh, uh, so, we, as we incorporate it into the plan, uh, which we certainly intend to do, I think that it's really uh, will be an essential function that we get it reviewed by our own staff uh, and members of this committee and uh, Susan, uh, just to see if there's any uh, comments that need to be had on it. I noticed Paul's hand is up, so I'm going to stop for a moment. So thank you, Andy. So it, as I said, we learned about the award 25 hours ago. We do not have a contract. I know we we have limited. Uh, we have one of the requirements of contract is that we would sit down with Susan to map out what her duty is going to be. We have limited duties. We can't have people contacting her. We have a specified contact point for Susan, and I know she knows that she's worked with other municipalities, and so you know we work through our. Our contract, we'll get the contract as soon as possible. As soon as we get the information from the state, we'll sit down, lay out how how it works best for her from her work style. She's done this many times in other communities. 
Um, I'm a bit nervous about our active citizen group reaching out to Susan and sort of burning through our the limited number of hours we have when we have specific things that we said that we wanted to accomplish. So the information you have is going to be really vital to directing that conversation. But again, I know, um, you know Susan is aware of this, that um, you know, the relationship is between our contact people and Susan to manage the time so we can be successful at this um, to meet the requirements of the grant that we applied for. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, no, I was not thinking of uh, anybody having direct contact uh, with Susan uh, other than uh, if staff have questions that uh, about the, the responses, but I didn't want to just put out responses to a number of questions that had been asked by other counselors without um, having a process for review and um, whether the process comes, um, and some of them were developed, it's quite obvious in conversations uh, with um, Guilford. So Guilford has had some input in this and already, but just to make sure um, it's not a long document, it's only about four pages total in the two, in the email and the other document. but. Uh, I think we do need to be clear that any contact, um, what you're suggesting is that any contact to Susan and request to Susan need to come through staff and be approved by staff um, to make sure it's consistent with the plan. Uh, I noticed Dorothy's hand is up for it. Um, just quickly, uh, I, I all of a sudden, I looked at that and it said 80 hours, oh, two weeks, and I thought, how did that number get determined? And if she finds out that she needs more, what do we do? Can we get more? The grant program is for 80 hours. That's how the grant program works. But could we could we get more if we needed it? We, we have not had a conversation with Susan about that. So, okay. you know, but the way the application is, is that they sort of divide up these regional coordinators times between different communities and then they allocate their time. So if she's, if, she, if her dance card is not full, maybe we can go forget more. Um, but if it is, then we have to be judicious about how we utilize her expertise. Absolutely. Thank you. So real quickly, uh, now put on the screen, you should have for you the current draft of the plan. And, um, I'm going to actually pause for a moment and turn it back to Shalini because the purposes of the bylaw uh, are a part that uh, she drafted and was reviewed by the committee. And uh, one of the things that we want to get to is uh, committee approving the, uh, the plan so that we know that we're moving forward in a consistent manner. And uh, Part of that then becomes uh, the purposes. So I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to say on that, Shalini? Yeah, I just think it's important that as we start working with Susan, that we're all on the same page regarding the goals for why we're initiating this bylaw. And if anyone had, I mean, I know the town council approved it, but this is our time in TSO, that if there are any additional goals you'd like, or does everyone feel comfortable with uh, the goals, because these goals help us navigate when we reach cross points or uh, when we reach crossroads and important decisions need to be made, like the goals is what are in a compass that's going to guide us through the process. So if anyone had any uh, questions, or is everyone good with the goals that will be guiding this bylaw? So you can see what the goals is. The next sections, and I can come back to this um, if need be, but I just want to go through it really quickly. We then, as uh, far as steps, came up with three steps that uh, were uh, labeled 2A, B, and C because we felt that they really needed to be studied together. They were separate subjects, but they, they relate to fact gathering to enable us to determine that this is something that we can move forward with and to then develop a bylaw that is consistent with um, what we've learned. And uh, the topics, then the goals are to develop possible 
town refuse uh, collection as opposed to the current system, which is a contract base, a contract between individual homeowners residents and uh, uh, the the hall that's providing or businesses in the hall that's providing. <clears throat> the second is to develop a system within that that um, scales the cost to the amount of trash. And some people call it pay as you throw, which is um, an alternative term, but that's the purpose is to uh, encourage uh, people to uh, put less into the landfill by um, having a correlation between what they pay so that there's a financial incentive to um, use alternative, which is composting, recycling, and um, other steps that are commonly defined, including thinking about what you're buying and have to throw in the trash and trying to re, um, reduce or recycle or um, reuse. Uh, they talk about the R's. Um, and the third one is to develop a possible compost component and trying to what we listed was a bunch of matters to consider and I have uh, chosen to any time that one of the sponsors has listed a matter to consider it's currently on the list. Um, I, I didn't vet anything out because there have been some suggestions, but there's been no process for doing that. So that was uh, where, and then um, after we get that factual development, then to align the bylaw that's being proposed, and it was the initial draft bylaw, and any regulations we might think are appropriate with the uh, planned, uh, uh, with, with what we've learned. Uh, and so uh, that's the way that's written and uh, conduct um, public input process um, at critical stages was the fourth uh, thing that we listed. So um, that basically is what the plan is. And the next step I was going to do, which Shalini was referring to, is to create a new column that would uh, fit in at some point where we would um, actually try and take the questions that had been posed by the counselors um, who um, submitted questions and uh, that have those initial responses and to incorporate that as appropriate into 2A, 2B, and 2C uh, so that they fit in thematically at the right point. So that is basically um, what it is. And I think that what we're looking to do is to see what questions that the committee now has that you would like to add to the list. Um, and secondly, uh, uh, maybe not tonight, I think probably not tonight, but at the next meeting then to um, see if we can get the committee to um, actually go through the formal, a formal step of adopting this uh, action plan. So. I'll stop there. Andy, can I also just add before um, other people have questions? Because last time we left off that we're going to try and separate out what are going to be the town staff and now Susan's questions. And what are some questions that we as a committee have to um, discuss? So I think we'll have that will be the next thing we'll work on in the work plan so that and then what are the timelines like? what discussions we can start having now while they are working on certain pieces. So we'll have a little bit more of the timeline if possible, as well as um, separation of responsibilities. A lot of this is probably going to be the town staff. And so Paul, is that something we need to get from you in terms of like what the town staff will do and what would you like us to do or how would that work? Again, I think the first thing we'd want is to meet with Susan, you know, get the contract signed first before, before we start engaging. Um, that, can, that can be done very quickly. It just depends when we get the paperwork. 
yeah. um, and then meet with Susan uh, and sort of understand what her expectations are, what what mm -hmm. her experience is, and then you know work with what the work. I mean, the amazing work that has already been done, and sort of figure mm -hmm. out, look to her for advice on how we integrate into um, provide support for what the what the council is trying to achieve here. Great. And also, can I just clarify the 2A where it says, um, I mean, I just want to clarify for everyone that the 2A where it says develop possible town refuse collection, we are talking about how to do that in a way that town is contracting. It's not really looking at town contracting versus individuals, right? Because that was already done by the last. Yeah. So what are you referencing? Uh, in the work plan, there is the 2A goal, which says develop possible town refuse collection. I mean, that can sound like we're gonna look at different alternatives, but I just wanted to clarify that based on the work already done by the last DEP, it was concluded, right? That um, that the way the best way forward for Amherst is to have a single contract, don't do it in-house, but if you want to reach our goals, then the best way forward is to, for the town to contract out. So within that, what are the options? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think, well, again, I, I, it's been 25 hours since we've known this, so right, I don't, right. don't want to okay. get into that, honestly, um, with that, with, with our contractors sitting in the audience, it's just sort of awkward right now. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, but that is something that actually I'll put on the list of things that we need to clarify because what we're really trying to do is see what we want to add to or modify in document before presenting it back one last time. Mm -hmm. So uh, the wording on that question. Um, it, it's certainly it's certainly one of them. Are there other things that, and this is kind of an open question, but important, Donna, uh, thoughts on things you'd like to look into? Thoughts question mark is always a dangerous question to ask me, Andy. Um, I, yeah, I just, I think I'm, I'm spinning a bit and I want to make sure I'm clear on what's happening here. So we were referred the proposed amended bylaw. And so, and this isn't, I'm not challenging this. I'm just making sure this is my understanding. So I want to make sure I'm, I'm on the right page here. TSO was referred the bylaw, the amend, proposed amendment to general bylaw 3.3, .3, refuse collection, recyclable materials. And what we are doing, because that amendment included a significant shift in point E, um, which, you know, I mean, already it looks like we've kind of made some shifts to that, which is, which is great, because um, in it, in that proposed amendment, it included um, either directly or through contract. So, you know, thinking through that is great. But in looking at this, we realized that this is not something that TSO alone can decide. And so we applied for the grant to get this expert opinion who's going to be supporting our research to kind of answer some of the either ors that were written in the initial bylaw that was sent to us. Is that correct? And so, so we're, I mean, we're looking long, long term here. Once we get that done, uh, once the sort of that work is done by the contractor, then, or, by the um by Susan Waite, we will come back and actually dig into the bylaw itself. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to make sure because there's so much happening that I was getting confused. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification, Anna. That's helpful. Yeah, I um you know, I think the early discussions that uh, some of us had with uh Paul and Guilford, we recognized that municipalities um, along um, historically were originally picking up trash themselves and that some do some don't uh, a lot of municipalities that had been um, running their own owning their own trash trucks and going around picking it up and then taking it to transfer or somehow directly to a landfill that that's uh, not existing in many communities now, I'd say most communities, and that um, in those communities they have switched over to contracting. 
we had been with the, that historic third model, which was town isn't involved in all, at all, and that it's the um, individual homeowner that contracted with the um, hauler. And uh, for us to now go into a system of having the town go back to that first that first alternative, which is um, having the town buy a fleet of trucks and pick up a tree, uh, start picking up trash, taking responsibility and having to pay um, at uh, the rates that it would negotiate with employees and incur all of the costs directly would probably be um, an unrealistic um, thing to try and establish at this point, both as far as um, first now is that would be required to establish such a system and the costs to uh, acquire the fleet and to actually administer the system on an ongoing basis. And uh, that uh, therefore it made most sense to go straight to the contracting model if we're gonna consider an alternative to the current. So I challenge you to, is that the way you understood it too? So is there anything else that uh, wants to be suggested at this point? Okay. Um, I had told uh, Anika earlier that um, we were gonna try and use time very carefully today because uh, we only wanted to um, go as far as we were prepared and, and material prepared to discuss. So what I think that we're going to do is the next step if uh, there's agreement from the committee is that the co-sponsors will uh, take the suggestions for change, but we're also gonna add um, all of the uh, issues that have been raised by counselors that have a number of questions that are pertinent. And I will send that out um, after this, um, not tonight, but um, I'll try and do it tomorrow as a document that shows what the uh, list of questions that had come from counselors was, and then uh, it'll give you a sense of the topics, but they will then be incorporated into the action plan within the appropriate sections and uh, will allow us uh, to um, continue to work with uh, Paul and Guilford as they shape the agreement with uh, Susan so that we can uh, move forward. So if that seems like an acceptable plan, then I think that um, I don't have anything else for today. I just wanted to add one more thing that I've created a folder in TSO where I'm planning to put all the public documents that we're sharing in terms of the research, uh, including there was a DEP um, workshop that was given on contracting, which is very interesting. I found it interesting. I've started watching it too are long, but so which I'm going to just dump everything in that. And I wanted to ask Athena, does that need to also be made then a public on the somewhere? public document somewhere because it's in SharePoint right now and it's called I think um hauler bylaw resources research and resources or something so I've created so Athena do we need to also create a parallel in somewhere else publicly um I can create a public folder on the TSO page as you work through the process so that those documents can be available in one place on the TSO committee page. Unfortunately, I can't do that kind of in real time as you add things to the SharePoint folder. It's not as um, yeah, it's not as dynamic as that our website. But if you let me know periodically when you've updated things, then I can I can pull things. I just can't check SharePoint. You know, I don't know to check SharePoint yeah, all the time when they're sure sure. No, and Athena can, I mean, if I can do that, like, since I'm already uploading it here, I'm happy to do it in the other place, too. Is that no. No. Oh. <laughs> no, sorry. Okay, okay. that'll make it easier for you. No. Okay, what I'll do is, when I'm uploading it, I'll just send you a link or something 
so that you know that these have been uploaded. Yep, if you just ping me um, when you'd like me to, you know, re repost what's there, then I can update the folder okay. on the TSO page. Perfect. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay, so if there's nothing else, I guess it's um, Anika, we're finished with the topic for tonight. We'll okay, if no one else, I see, uh, Alicia, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, no, thank you, Anika. I was here just hoping to hear um, any questions anyone has. I'm really excited um, that we were accepted for the technical assistance. And so just looking forward to moving forward and being able to actually work on the bylaw. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight and look forward to continuing the discussion with you all. Thank you to Darcy Dumont and Susan Wait for being with us as well. And uh, so let's see, we're going to, with that, move on to town, town manager appointments. Has everyone had a chance to take a read? Nicely done. All right. And do we have a motion to recommend? Does Paul want to talk about it first or? Yeah, Paul, do you want to have add anything sure. else? Yeah, I mean, really thrilled with uh, that uh, Melissa Ladici, Ladici Walker has um, applied for and uh, went through our process, a pretty detailed process, um, and unanimously uh, recommended by everybody who served, who interviewed her multiple times. Um, she is uh, sitting uh, HR director and for the Berkshire Community College. Uh, she's a, an attorney, has a master's in social work, uh, got her bachelor's degree from UMass, um, mm -hmm. and for, has served 14 years as a practicing attorney in, in employment law. Um, is going to be a great partner, I think, uh, uh, for our DEI director. Um, she, uh, Pamela led the search and she has been a big advocate for her. So just thrilled to have her um, accept the offer and so um yes i rec ask you to uh approve her appointment thank you were there any other questions or comments this is exciting yeah um i am ready with a motion anika if you want me to do it go right ahead all right i move that tso recommend to the town council the appointment of melissa lodici is that who said it walker to the position what it was it all right, to the, I don't know, Paul, to the position of human resources director right. of the town of Amherst. I apologize for mispronouncing the name. It does not reflect at all how excited I am for you to take this job. <laughs> and now I believe I need a second. Second. Okay, all right, roll call. So Shalini. Yes. Andy. Yes. Dorothy. Yes. I'm a yes and Anna. Yes. Okay, that is unanimous. And I believe our last order of business would be the minutes. Has everyone had a chance to take a look at the minutes? All right, so I will move to approve. Is there a second? Second, Devlin got there. Thank you. All right, Dorothy. Yes. Anna. Yes. I may yes. Shalini. Dean, I'm sorry, I didn't read them. Okay. Uh, Andy. Yes. Okay, so that will be for yes and one abstain. All right. And um, with that, I believe we have come to the end of yet another great meeting. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we will uh, see you all our, our next meeting and actually with most of us we'll see you I guess on Monday <laughs> all right have a great night everyone meeting adjourned good night, good night everyone. Thank you.